welcome to Ireland. You were affected by the fog, but you finally made it. I did. T tell us a little bit about what you do and your company and where it came from. Sure. So DraftKings is a one-day length fantasy sports site uh, that we launched about three and a half years ago in the US and Canada. And uh, right now, we offer 10 different sports, uh, you know, the whole spectrum from NFL football, hockey, uh, NASCAR, you know, everything that really has a big fan following in the US, we look to support. And what players do is they come on and create an account, and uh, they choose a sport that they want to play, and they build lineups of real-life athletes that are participating in that sport. And based on how well their athletes perform in their lineup versus other people on the site, um, you compete and can win pretty big cash prizes. So you said that it's only three and a half years since you launched, but I was reading figures and, and you know, you're a huge company. What has been the formula for your success? I think it's a couple things. One has been from day one just being really relentless about focus on the customer. What are people asking for? Uh, what do they want to see next? And I think by constantly giving a great experience, people come back. We have incredible retention rates. We see negative churn from year two to year three. It's uh, really just been focus on the customer. I think that's shown us really great uh, return usage and retention. And also just being very aggressive, I think, in the sense of we see a really large market out there and huge potential, and we don't want to miss that opportunity. There's, uh, you know, 50 plus million fantasy players worldwide. We have 6 million right now on our platform. So I think there's a massive opportunity and we're really in the first inning as far as what we can do. So, uh, you know, the aggression in terms of media spend, just trying to be everywhere that our target demo is, has been a big part of what got us here and what we'll continue to look to do. Something as well that is quite fascinating is that the, um, the different sports associations have really jumped on board. Why do you think that is? Yeah, so in 2013, we signed the first league deal in Daily Fantasy with Major League Baseball. And I think what Major League Baseball saw in the product was a really large increase in engagement. You know, when, when people participate in fantasy, you know, watching the sport is still fun, but it just amplifies everything. You know, instead of just caring about your home team, you care about all of the teams, you know, anybody that's in your lineups. And our players are very engaged with the content. You know, they'll watch games all the way through to the last game of the night, the last pitch. Um, and they'll consume a lot more supplementary content as well, whether it's fantasy content or beat writers or whatever it is. So it's a very virtuous cycle between playing fantasy and consuming the sports content and vice versa and really just lifts all boats. So I think the leagues and teams and uh, even big media partners really like what they see in terms of the engagement that fantasy creates. Is there a sense that these associations and the big um, sporting organizations, they, they don't want to miss the boat, they want to be on it? They're not sure where it's going, but they want to be on it. Yeah, I mean, I think there was a lot of, um, a lot of organizations look to what NFL in the US has done with fantasy and how that's really driven their business and um, want to kind of apply that in their sport. You know, we've added a lot of sports that traditionally didn't have huge fantasy followings like PGA golf, for example. There was really a non-existent kind of fantasy market before DraftKings and we launched two years ago and saw some exceptional numbers this year in, in PGA, just drove tons of adoption and uh, yeah, I think it's been an interesting evolution to watch kind of everybody jump on board with fantasy and, and really try to get the most out of, out of their fans and the engagement as they can. But Matt, it hasn't been plain sailing all of the time. The last few months especially, there's been a lot of controversies, there's been a lot of negative press. How has that impacted you? Yeah, we haven't gotten a ton of sleep recently over the last you know, month or so. We've been working really hard on... Um, just kind of navigating the waters that come with the territory now. I mean, we're not a small startup anymore. We have a lot of users. Uh, people spend a lot of money on our platform. And I think certain things come with the territory of, of being in that position. And, you know, we're ready to be, uh, you know, the company that takes that head on. We're certainly, you know, we're in Boston. We're in the U.S. We're not uh, certainly hiding from anyone. We're working through the issues that 
uh, I think are really important to our players, which include, you know, how are we going to make sure that there's always a level playing field for everybody on the platform, and uh, how do we make sure data is safe and secure, and all of those issues that are really relevant. I mean, we want to certainly focus the time and energy to make sure we get it right on every dimension. And at the moment, you're occupying a space that isn't regulated. There's online gambling isn't um, allowed in America, but what you do is perceived as gaming. Do you think that it's going to be a regulated industry in the future? I think regardless of the role that the government wants to play in fantasy sports, we'll still do the same things. You know, we're going to look to uh, put in the proper controls and the different uh, sort of product features that our players really care about and want. And I think there's a lot of alignment there. Like these are things that have always been relevant topics to our business that we want to make sure that over time we continuously improve and, and innovate on. And um, I think certainly we're working with everybody who wishes you know, to, to collaborate with us on that, including government agencies and things like that. Um, but our objectives are really the same. We want to bring a uh, really solid experience to our players and make sure everything that they care about, you know, we're addressing it head on. There's huge um, money deals um, been done and, and huge money involved. From that sense, are you worried that if it does become regulated, what will the future hold for you in your industry? Um, not really. I mean, I think fantasy is so mainstream now. Uh, you know, there's millions and millions of players on daily fantasy platforms who love the game and they come day after day to play. And I think um, our partners see that. All of our partners are still here. Like, nobody uh, is shook by what's going on. I mean, across every dimension, teams, leagues, media partners. Um, and I think the reason is because fantasy is a part of mainstream American culture and soon to be worldwide, hopefully. So I think... Um, you know, as long as that value is there, I think we'll see a lot of support around fantasy in whatever form it is. And DraftKings was even mentioned in a presidential debate recently. Why do you think it gets such a huge level of interest that you said people that, you know, might be running the country are talking about it during debates? <laughs> yeah, we, we were joking about whether or not that would show up in the debate, thinking, like, who would have ever thought three years ago when we started this thing that fantasy sports would be a relevant topic in a presidential debate, but it was, and um, I think we all really enjoyed that, uh, that exposure and just seeing how prominent what we've built has really become. Uh, I think it's the goal of every tech entrepreneur to create something that people really care about and is well adopted, and, um, you know, it, it was pretty interesting to see on a platform like that the topic of daily fantasy sports coming up. So tell me about um, what makes a good fantasy player, because I play fantasy Premier League and I, I just buy the players that I like as opposed to studying the stats. What, what makes a good fantasy player? So I think there's all kinds of different fantasy players, really. Uh, the vast majority of people are extremely recreational with it. You'll see them play you know, a league that might cost 25 cents in the US or, or $3, you know, something very small. And, um, they're doing it for fun. They're doing it to enjoy the games that they're going to be watching anyway more. And that's really the, I think, vast bulk of what we see is recreational, you know, fantasy play, people playing friends in private leagues, things like that. Um, there's certainly a segment of people who are more quantitative. There's a segment of people who are more kind of intuitive. They sponge information by watching a lot of sports, watching a lot of games. And it's a spectrum, you know, we see really everything out there. Uh, I don't think there's like a specific prototype of you have to be X to be a successful fantasy player. Um, in terms of the target though, I would say, I think people who are attracted by skill-oriented games, things that are competitive, not easily mastered, those are people that tend to be attracted to the product. And, we see over time people are able to learn the game, they become more effective, they put up better lineups, better scores, and um, you know, it's just a, a game that you're not gonna solve on your first attempt, like it takes time, and uh, through research, through effort, you can become really good. So you see it as a game of skill as opposed to gambling on, on something that you think you know about? Yeah, I think we've seen so much data at this point where it's almost a, a kind of moot point. Like, it's clearly a game of skill. We have tons of data that shows 
you know, people over time become more effective as they learn the game, they study it, they, um, they kind of test different things and determine their approach. And um, it's much different than, say, a chance-based game that you would see um, where it's some kind of flip of a coin or something like that. Like, there's very clear differences between the people who are at the top of the game and the people who are new or just kind of getting started. And uh, I think our goal as it relates to that is, you know, creating a really great new user onboarding experience, offering beginner games where new people can compete against each other, um, things like that we do to try to make sure people have a great experience early on as they're just kind of getting ramped up with the product. And um, but there's no question it's a skill game. I think uh, anybody who's tried it will, will testify to that. You've plans to expand. What's, the, what's happening next for you? So definitely international expansion has been high on our radar. Um, top of the list for us is, uh, is in the UK. I mean, we definitely think that there's a really great market opportunity in the UK. And I think there's a lot of other countries that are very comparable that are sort of low hanging fruit for us. Um, you know, just being here, I can see the culture of the cities and things, and uh, it reminds me a lot of what you'll see in Boston or New York. It's really not so different, right? Like, people love sports. They love to watch the games. Um, there's just a ton of enthusiasm, and this is just another way that you can amplify that and, and have an even better experience while you're watching sports. You have big competitors there. FanDuel is one of them. What's it like, I guess, kind of going head to head with another company for the same market that you are so closely um, up against each other? Yeah, I think it's competition makes everybody better. I don't think the industry would be where it's at if you know there wasn't a, a really good competition between two plus companies, and nobody's complacent. I think where. We're all pretty content to get out there and compete in FanDuel as well. You know, we're certainly really competitive, but there's also a lot of industry topics where it's extremely collaborative and we're on great terms. Uh, and I think we're really good about separating out, you know, that competition for users, the competition to acquire and retain, and putting that over here. And then you kind of have industry topics where it's really essential that we're aligned and. Uh, there's no place for competition in that stuff. Like you just have to be able to work together and collaborate and and get to good outcomes on things that are of relevance to the whole industry. And so I think that's kind of the place we're in now is uh, you know just trying to make sure we have that right mindset and that right balance. And as the industry grows and develops and, and things change and regulations are coming in, one that has just come in is that you the people who work for your company and found you that you can't um, play the other's game. Is that something that you're welcoming? Yeah, we're certainly welcoming it. I think at this stage we're at as a company, the amount of users that we have, it's a step that needs to be taken. I think early on in the industry when it was new, it was really important to have experts who could speak to the product. They knew kind of what players would want to see. They had a lot of experience in, in the game and they were able to kind of craft and mold the product and the customer treatments from a retention standpoint. And while that was really helpful in the first couple of years, I think we're just in a different place now as an industry where um, it's more important now that there's no question that when you come on and play, you can always trust and, and know that the game is uh, of highest integrity. And the idea of having any sort of like fantasy players working at a company that, that runs the games is just not something that makes sense. So it was tough. I mean, I think we... We certainly like the idea of having strong experts contributing to our product, and it was a tough decision, but I think at the end of the day, we have to put the, the players first and make sure that they know that, you know, without question, the game can be trusted completely. And does not having athletes and players that actually play the, the games like football and hockey not being allowed to play, does that help as well? Yeah, so every league sets their own policy for that, and. We completely support you know, whatever that they feel makes sense in terms of their players uh, and participation in fantasy. So we're there to help. We, you know, anytime a league has a specific thing they want to implement around player controls, we try to help and uh, you know, bring all of our resources to the table to make sure that we can help them execute that. You really are growing an industry that's, it really is in its infancy. What has been the biggest challenges that you faced? Man, I would say there's so many. Um, 
scale is really tough at the level that we've been growing. Um, and it's not just technology scale. Like, certainly, it's hard to keep the platform you know, in a place where it can support the level of you know, concurrent users that we see now. And it's a very unique tech challenge at a company like DraftKings, where all of your users are kind of on the platform at the same time. You know, if it's NFL Sunday and the games start at whatever, 6 PM here, everybody's on the platform at 5.50 at the same time doing the same things. And it's a very unique tech challenge to solve. And I think we've brought in some of the like, really sharpest technologists to come in and take that on. And you know, we've had a very successful football season in spite of you know, eight 10x growth in users. And on the people side, I would say just scaling an organization. You know, we were at 40, 50 employees last year at this time. Now we're at 300. You know, you have to, it doesn't sound hard, but you have to really design an organization and continue to review it and continue to make sure that everybody you're bringing on set up for success, that they have a clear role, clear scope. And it's a lot. I mean, it takes a lot of time to make sure that the organization's in a place where, you know, everybody can be successful and, and deliver in their role. And what is your role then within the company on a day-to-day on -day basis? Yep. So I run our revenue operations, so all of our customer retention, uh, VIP management, events, um, everything that's related to our contests and promotions on the site. You know, so basically, the, all of the things that uh, you would engage with or see as a player on DraftKings, my team uh, delivers that. And where do you, you know, you said you had 50 employees in a year ago and now you have 350. Where do you, in a year's time, where do you think DraftKings will be? Yeah, it's been such a land grab on every dimension and it's hard to project. I mean, we do a lot of business planning and like we might be here or we might be here. Yeah, there's so many scenarios out there of how things could unfold. And I think, um, you know, right now our, our focus is on just creating a great experience. And, you know, if we do that, players will come and we don't know if we'll grow by 3 million or 5 million or 10 million more players next year. But I think we know that if we continue to focus on, you know, the best experience possible for people, will win in the way that we want to in terms of just that, that land grab for the market opportunity. And on the talent side as well, you know, people are attracted by a fast growing, exciting company. And I think our focus on the people side is get a talent, get the best people you can. And um, if you bring on great talent, then things take care of themselves really well. Great. Well, thanks very much for joining us. And uh, no doubt you'll have an interesting few months ahead. Thanks, yeah, Matt. I agree. <laughs>